Space Sun. I'm Daisy Victoria, and today we are diving into medieval fashion, specifically the 12th century or the 1100s. Oh, by the way, my friend asked me what Hey Sun Space Sun means. Hey Sun is Swedish for hello, and Space Sun doesn't mean anything. It just rhymes with Hey Sun. My mom and cousins used to say it a lot when I was little. Sometimes my mom would answer the phone and go, Hey Sun Space Sun, and it's just really cute and it's always stuck with me. By the way, this is my first recording without my braces, so I'm super excited. It's been a long time coming. The dress we're looking at today is one of the medieval dresses that I always wanted to make as a child because it's really influenced in a lot of fantasy art that we see today. And in fact, it was the second dress that I made when I joined the Society for Creative Anachronism, and I was so excited to finally have a place to wear dresses like this. What dress is that? That dress is known as a blio. This is a French term used to describe the style of dress surrounding about the 12th century. This dress is found throughout a lot of period sources, but the thing with art from this era is that it doesn't clearly depict exactly how the clothes were made, so there's a lot of interpretation. There's been a lot of studies and research on the clothing from this period. One book that has a lot of information is this one. Um, this has a lot of academic articles in it. Particularly, Janet Snyder is a researcher who's looked a lot into this era, and she's compiled a lot of research from other academics as well. So when we want to put together how these garments were made, first a small note on the term blio. In reenactment circles, everyone kind of knows that blio refers to this type of dress. Characteristics of the blio are long trailing sleeves, a fitted bodice, and then a voluminous skirt. Now that said, dress styles were not just, you know, mandated to be <laughs> like one specific way in one specific place in the Middle Ages. So you see a lot of similarities between dresses from different regions and they'll go by different names based on where they are. So when I've dived a little bit deeper into this period, I've found lots of other words referring to dresses that look like this as well. So I just want to put that out there that we don't need to kind of put everything into one little box. <laughs> There's lots of different terms out there and lots of similarities region to region. For this particular video, I will be using the word blio just for simplicity and because I think you guys will know what I'm talking about. And also I'm looking at research from French sources, so it kind of makes sense. Now, since we don't have an extant blio and we don't know exactly how these were put together, it's up to us to kind of figure it out based on the information we do have. We can see certain things in the period artwork, the illuminations, and the statues from this era. We can see things like that more fitted bodice. So coming into the 12th century, we're starting to see more fitting in the bodice. And you can see some evidence of that based on sort of the wrinkles and stuff around the bodice. The statues from the Chartres Cathedral are very well known for their amazing depiction of this type of garment. Many blios have long trailing sleeves. They're various lengths. Some of them are even tied into knots, which could be aesthetic, it could also be practical if the sleeves are so long they need to be knotted to stay off the ground. There's a wide array of detail work on these types of dresses, which makes sense since there are so many people wearing them. People of different classes would have different variations on the style. I've made a number of blios before, and I've gone with a certain interpretation based on those in the Chartres Cathedral, and that is what, in the article in this book, is referred to as the blio giorne, which has sort of a pleated on skirt. This time I am doing a different variation. I have a few motivations for trying this out. One is that I want to try a different style so I can just try some new things and test patterning. Two is that I would like to tie this in with some of the other things I've done. So anytime we research periods that are sort of before and after each other, as well as locations that existed near each other in those periods, I think it gives us more of a complete picture of what's going on in fashion. 
three, I want to show this off to you guys because I think this is something that will help a lot of people. And four, I'm about to reveal something that is an idea I've had for a really long time. And now I guess I'm committing myself to it. So I have wanted for a while to sort of recreate what Eleanor of Aquitaine would have worn. She's a famous queen from the 12th century, and in doing so, I wanted to test out a little bit more from the 12th century before I kind of dove straight in. This project was kind of a quick one, and it isn't the Eleanor of Aquitaine dress of my dreams, however, it is a tool to study the era and give me a little more insight into what I'm going to use when I do that dress eventually. Now you guys are gonna have to hold me to it. There are a lot of things we do know about the 12th century based on things that we do have surviving. There are also a lot of things that we do not know. And that is where we go beyond the base research and archeology span and we get into what is known as experimental archeology. span this means we are working with what we do have and we are experimenting to see how our ideas based on the research and the evidence we do have would have potentially worked. Reenactors and costumers are very helpful in this way because we are trying out ideas from the era and from what archeological evidence we do have. And we are using that to reconstruct something which may be extrapolated a little bit or interpolated between various eras. And we're putting together what the idea is and we're testing out how it works. So that allows us to get a little bit more insight into how things might have existed in the period. And I think that's pretty cool. Also, it's fun and I like to do it. One more note is on fabrics from this era. We would typically see the outer gowns made of wools, maybe even silks, especially for upper class. Linen did exist in period as well. In addition to wearing a linen undergarment I already had, I will be using linen for the dress. That is my personal choice based on one, the climate where I live, and two, the fact that I previously thrifted some linen that I think would be great for this project. So I am using this project as sort of an experiment to try out some of this patterning and also take some of these ideas with me to a more complex project later. If you are interested in more information about the textiles from this era, I know if you've been on my channel before you've seen me reference this book, I really like it. And it has a lot of information on just what the textiles were, the weaves down to trims, buttonholes, all kinds of stuff like that. So I'm not sponsored, I just really like it. We do have extant garments from the Middle Ages that are not exactly the blio, but can provide a little insight into how garments were constructed in that time period. So we have a lot of evidence of rectangular construction from this era, as well as before and after it. Rectangular construction means that the pieces are primarily rectangles along with triangles. So as I pattern this dress, it's going to look very similar to the standard sort of tea tunic or underdress that I made in a prior video and that I have a PDF tutorial for. Because I love the Blio style so much, that's something I would love to develop into a more full thought out tutorial in the future. However, before I do that, I want to include some of the methods I've tried before, the methods I've tried right now, as well as some things I'm going to do on the Eleanor of Aquitaine dress. There's a lot you can do with this type of style and era. I think it's really helpful for those of us who do things like reenactments, even ren fairs and historical LARPs, fantasy clothing, you can use it for cosplay. It's really not that difficult of a pattern to put together being primarily rectangles and being from before clothing went through its complication phase. Totally not a scientific term. <laughs> so I think this is great and I like how it's kind of accessible to a lot of people. And hopefully seeing me go through it will help you because I know that reading all of the research and trying to figure it out yourself can be a little bit intimidating. However, if you do want to do that, hopefully I've given you a couple of resources that can get you started and then you can go down the rabbit hole and 
I'll meet you on the other side. All right, let's make this dress. I'm feeling pretty gosh darn sick today. I think it's some kind of flu. I'm gonna give myself some rest and not work at all on the projects I had planned and the things I need to get done. Instead today, I'm gonna work on something that's just for me, though I guess it's kind of for you too because I'm filming it. A couple of months ago, I found a lot of pink linen at the thrift store. I really love this color. This project, I'm gonna test out a couple of ideas I have that I haven't used on Blios in the past, and I'm gonna see how they work. So this is gonna be a fun, just dress I can wear to events when it's hot out, and it's also gonna be an experimental dress that's kind of like a working mock-up and a study on a couple of variations. I'm starting by cutting out two rectangles for the body of this dress. The two rectangles are wide enough to go around my bust plus seam allowance, and they are long enough to go from my shoulder to the floor, plus I'm adding several inches because I want to be able to gather up the sides quite a lot in the side lacing. I'm trying to go for the look in some of the statues where it looks like the side lacing is really, really gathered with lots and lots of little pleats across the torso. So. I cut a slit in the front and back center of these two panels where I'm going to insert gores in the skirt. I also cut a slit in the top so that I can create a neckline. One thing I'm trying out here is the idea that the neckline is actually just a straight cut and not actually cut in a round circle. So we'll see how it goes. For the sleeves, I decided that the best way to conserve fabric was to cut the upper portion as a separate piece from the lower portion. These are simply rectangles, except for the lower portion of the sleeve, I am curving that so it gets that nice, like, long bell shape effect. There are also small square gussets that go under the arms. Apparently I didn't video them, I guess they were so simple, but you can see them in the video I have linked for the chemise or underdress tunic. They're pretty much exactly the same, and you'll see them when I sew them in pretty soon. The triangular portion of this dress is the gores that go in the skirt. We're going to include gores on the sides, which is the same as the chemise I made before. This time, since the dress is very fitted and I want a really big skirt, I'm also putting gores in the front and back. Now, as happens with basic geometry, you can see here that one side of that triangle is much, much longer than the other side. So what I'm going to do is just measure and make sure it's the same length all the way around, and I'm measuring from that upper corner to do that. Rectangular construction is pretty efficient. This is all of my fabric waste. The first thing I did sewing-wise was I sewed the sleeve pieces together, so I would just have like single sleeves, and then I sewed the gores into the center front and center back. The corner of the gore can be a little bit tricky sometimes. One thing you can do is sew by hand there at the corner to try and finesse it a little bit more. I know a lot of my friends like to do that as well. I usually just kind of finagle it in the sewing machine, but here I tried to get it a little more perfect with hand stitching. Next, I am sewing these very long body pieces together. They look really, really long, and that's because they are, because I added all that extra length. We're going to see how that length works out once this dress comes together. I'm really excited to see. Gores go into the sides as well as the front and back, and here you can see a little gore secret. If you don't sew all the way to the edge, it'll be a little bit easier. I surged all of my seams on the inside to finish them. Here we get to those little gussets on the sleeves. I am sewing those just onto the end of the sleeve. And just like the other gores, I like to leave a little bit at the edge so it's easier with that seam allowance to sew the other side. All right, so we're coming along, really like it. 
This is sort of how you do the gusset in the sleeve. So you're going to sew the other corner to the other side of the sleeve. Ta-da! We have extra width at the top of the sleeve. Well, after we sew it down anyway. Yeah, I guess the sewing machine will be better than just pinning it. Ah, there we go. And then you can sew the rest of the sleeve all the way down to the hem. I chose to make my sleeves pretty long, but not dragging on the ground. So I won't have to knot them, but you know, I could if I wanted to, I could make them shorter. But I think I'll leave them just as they are. As for the side gores, a little trick I did here just to make my life easier because it seems like I may have made dresses before like this. I decided to sew a little bit above the gore there. So I will be putting side lacing in here, but this is just gonna make it a little bit easier to do that rather than working inside the gore. The dress is structurally together now, so I went ahead and did the hems. I am hemming by machine. Sometimes I hem by hand if it's something I want to really look more historic. With something like this that's kind of a sample and a working mock-up and an experiment, I don't really care as much. You are welcome to do your hems by hand or by machine. You know, if you're making something, it's yours, so I think you should do whatever makes you happy. So looking at the torso of the dress, my bust is a lot bigger than my waist and we want this to be fitted. So what I'm doing is I'm measuring at the waist how much I need to sort of cut off and then I'm curving the dress in there. Next, I hemmed those side openings and I created a bunch of tiny buttonholes on my sewing machine. Again, you could do these eyelets by hand. I do in fact have a video to help you if you would like to learn to do them by hand. I am spiral lacing the dress, which is usually what we see on the source images from these particular dresses in period. And I'm using a plastic yarn needle to help me do that easily. Next, I'm making some light pink bands. These are actually made from scraps left over from my ruffled kirtle, which goes under my strawberry dress that I promise is almost done. Basically, all of my little pieces are just rectangles that I am ironing and making sure they fit wherever I want them on the dress, which in this case is along the neckline and also a belt. A lot of these dresses have some type of neckline detail, some of them can be very fancy, some of them a little plainer, and we are going for basic pattern testing right now. But obviously something pretty because I want to wear it. And here's the dress laid out flat. Here you can see what the gathering on the side seams looks like. So basically I just gathered it and pulled it up real tight so that it gathered up like that. Underneath the dress, I'm wearing a very basic chemise. It's the same one I made in that video that I linked on sort of the more basic version of this type of style. And the veil is a linen veil that I already had. This veil is a rectangle. You also see veils that are more oval in this period. So there are some options. This crown is not quite historically accurate, but you know, I like it. And when you're dressed up in a pretty pink fairy tale dress, you might as well get some fairy tale princess photos. 
The entire time that I was taking these photos, I was thinking about my aunt Stephanie and how much I wanted to send her a photo so she could see this dress because I know she would be very proud. The last dress that I completed was Holiday Barbie, and my very last text exchange with my aunt was actually a photo of my Holiday Barbie dress. I didn't know how much I would miss her while I was taking these photos, but I want to honor my aunt, and I think it's really awesome that I think of her with this dress, and perhaps every time I wear it I'll think of her. One of the reasons I love studying historical clothing, other than that I think it's really pretty, is that I feel some sort of a connection to the energy of the world before me. I think it's really powerful to be able to connect with others, whether they're alive now or in the past or even in the future. And I really hope that by sharing my projects with you, that it helps to inspire some connection with you as well. So I did the pictures and the reveal footage of the dress. I really, really like it. It's so comfy and easy to wear. So I think it'll work for a lot of events. The one thing is that I think I made it a little bit long. When I was trying to make sure it was long enough to do all the gathering up at the sides, I cut it extra long and I think I could take off about two or three inches and I'd be fine. I can still wear it, I just have to kind of pick it up when I walk around, which is great for like a fancy court queen dress. So like whenever I do get around to the Eleanor of Aquitaine look, making it extra long would be great. <laughs> but if this is a dress that I'm going to actually wear normally, it's a little long. But other than that, it's perfect. I really, really like it. I like the color too. I mean, you can't go wrong with multiple shades of pink. Also importantly, I think this does draw together more of a bigger picture of the clothing of this time. I've done a little bit with this portion of the medieval period before, and doing this dress kind of draws together the more tunic style dresses, and then the other types of bleos and things like that that I've done as well. So that's something that I really appreciate, is getting sort of a full picture of fashion history or the styles of the time or the timeline because I think it's really cool to learn from all of those who came before us and maybe who walk among us still in the spirit world. What do you guys think? If you get some inspiration from this, please feel free to tag me. I'm Daisy Victoria on all the social medias. My website is daisyvictoria.com. And a special thank you to my patrons over on Patreon who help me so much to continue creating awesome content like this. I hope you all have an absolutely magical day and I'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye.